I've got uh, the great privilege of uh, introducing Prasad, who's uh, who's been here for for so long that even even he doesn't know when he started. Uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, when uh, when Prasad started his uh, BME degree, he's gone through that and. He reckons 2006, but it seems longer than that, really, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, Prasad has uh, just finished his uh, PhD uh, um, uh, oral last week, and about a month ago. A month ago. <laughs> <laughs> time, time just seems to, you know, go flies. <laughs> yeah. A month ago, um, and uh, um, you know, so he's. <laughs> He's very, uh, very keen and uh, and able, I think, to uh, start on a uh, on a research career of his own. So I'm sure we're going to see, uh, you know, Prasad doing some uh, excellent work around here, and and you know, beyond the the near future. Um, so what Prasad has done for his PhD uh, um, is some fundamental work on identifiability of, uh, um, you know, trying to uh, estimate the. Um, uh, mechanical properties of, uh, of soft tissue. It's really been a, a great, you know, joy and privilege to uh, to, to work with Prasad over these years. Um, um, one of the things, though, that you uh, you have to understand about Prasad, and I, he's really let me down because every time uh, t today he has, every time you know uh, Prasad was uh, was around over summer, he would always be wearing his. Oh. Uh, his uh, oh. You know, coat, uh, you know, is yeah. it, it was uh, way too cold, even though it was probably 30 degrees in, inside. <laughs> oh my um, God. <laughs> another interesting thing about Prasad is, uh, you know, uh, he, he, when he's talking, he often doesn't finish his... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sentences. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cool. It's all yours. Okay. Cool. So, um, oh, I'll turn this off. <laughs> ah, yeah. So, yep. So, I'll talk uh, today about uh, considerate parameter identifiability and the design of experiments for applications in breast biomechanics. So, uh, breast cancer affects one in every 10 women worldwide, and 400,000 women die from the disease each year. Differing imaging modalities are used uh, to diagnose the disease, such as MRI imaging, mammography, and ultrasound. Um, and each of these have their own benefits and drawbacks. Now, studies have shown that uh, combining the information from these different imaging modalities can help Im strengthen uh, the diagnosis of the disease. However, it's quite difficult to co-locate regions of interest between these images due to the varying degrees of deformation each imaging procedure applies to the breast. Now, once we've actually, uh, you know, identified where this, uh, where the tumor is, it's also difficult to t predict where uh, these tumors will be during treatment of the disease, as this is not performed under image guidance. So, what we aim to do is to build patient-specific biomechanical models to aid the diagnosis and treatment of the disease. So, we can use this model to simulate the deformation occurring during the imaging uh, procedures to help uh, co-locate. Uh, the tumor between these images, and we can also use the models to predict the, uh, the location of the tumors during the treatment procedures. And now, and, and this, uh, this aspect of the problem is what I consider in my thesis. So, obtaining biomechanical predictions uh, requires identification of uh, spa patient specific um, model parameters, such as the geometry and uh, the different tissue properties. Now, the, the geometry uh, can be identified from measurements, and the tissue properties can be identified from mechanical testing. However, one issue is that it's, it's very difficult to determine which tests are required to robustly identify these parameters uh, due to the complex composition and arrangement of uh, the different tissues in the breast and the variation in their properties, spatially, uh, temporally with age, and also with the state of the tissue. Now, the degree of, the va of this variation is unknown. So the goal of my thesis was to use physics-based modeling to predict breast tissue movement. The first objective uh, was to develop patient-specific biomechanical models to simulate breast repositioning from the prone position to the supine position. And the second objective was to develop methods to assess and improve the identifiability of model parameters. Uh, so I'll give an outline of the talk um, 
So the first thing I'll talk about is uh, the, some studies I did on validating the modeling of soft layered bodies using synthetic materials. Then I'll talk about how we modeled uh, breast biomechanics. And lastly, I'll talk about uh, a study I performed for designing experiments uh, to improve the identifiability of breast model parameters. So in this thesis, uh, I simulated the mechanics using a quasi-static finite elasticity formulation solved using the finite element method in open CMOS. Now all the, uh, the bodies we considered, uh, we assumed they were incompressible, isotropic, and governed by Neohookian mechanics. Uh, and this requires a single stiffness parameter, uh, theta here, uh, to be defined, which uh, describes the mechanical behavior of the, um, of the body. So I performed these controlled experiments on synthetic materials to ensure that the models uh, that were developed in this thesis uh, predict the mechanics of, of real soft objects. So um, I considered two layer arrangements. The first arrangement was uh, two layers of similar thickness. And this is what we observe in the breast, for example, between muscle and breast tissue. Also, I also considered a stiffer, uh, thin layer coupled to an underlying softer layer. And this is what we observe, for example, in skin. So I validated the modeling of the first arrangement, the two layers of similar thickness, by performing experiments on a silicon gel cantilever beam under gravity loading. Now these experiments also provided a platform for investigating uh, parameter identifiability. So here's this beam um, that I constructed uh, out of silicon gel, which has two layers. So what I did was laser scanned uh, the deformed shape of this beam in eight different orientations. Then I created a finite element model and assigned an in initial estimate of uh, the Neohookian stiffness to e of each layer. And what we can then do is solve the mechanics for a given orientation and it will give us a prediction of the deformed shape. So uh, what we can then do is for that same orientation, we can take our laser scan data and project that onto the surface uh, of the model. And, and this allows us to construct an objective function. Now this describes, uh, you know, the difference between the difference in shape between the model predicted, uh, the difference between the model predicted shape and the measured shape. So to identify the parameters, we can vary the stiffness of each layer until we minimize this objective function, and this allows us to identify those parameters. So we did this for uh, each orientation independently. For example, here's one of the orientations. And uh, when we applied that, when we minimize the objective function, we get these uh, stiffness values, 1.82 kilopascals and 1.46 kilopascals. Uh, and what we found was that we get really a, a really good fit to the data, a root mean squared error of 0 0.3 millimeters. Now, we can actually do this same procedure for each orientation independently, and this is, these are the results we get. So individually, we get really good fits to the data of the same order of magnitude, so a root mean squared error of 0 0.3 millimeters. Uh, however, our parameter estimates uh, vary quite wi widely. Um, and this actually, this means that we have these multiple solutions. Now the question is, which one of these should we use to predict uh, deformation of this cantilever beam? And, uh, what we can find is that some of these orientations may give you poor uh, predictions. For example, let's take this vertical beam. If we used its, um, param its parameters and predicted the deformation occurring in the other orientations, we find we get up to 8 millimeter root mean squared errors, which is 27 times larger than the individual fit, uh, individual fits. So we can uh, have a look at what's going on here by plotting the objective function uh, on the parameter space. So here's a cantilever beam or orientation we considered. And this is the, uh, the objective function on the parameter space. And this describes how the root mean squared error uh, changes as we change the parameters. So we can look at the contours of this, the isocontours of, uh, um, of this plot. And, and this is what we get over here. So the marker here indicates the optimal set of parameters. And the ISO contour line here indicates an optimal root mean squared error corresponding to that optimal uh, set of parameters uh, plus a 0 0.1 millimeter offset. Now this, uh, this region defined by this contour actually uh, represents a region influenced by experimental uncertainty. So we can see here immediately even with one, um, you know, even within one orientation we can get multiple solutions. And, uh, because if we move that marker anywhere within that contour, we will get 
are within, will always be within 0.1 millimeter of the optimal RMSE. So we can actually do this. We can plot these contours for all the different orientations, and then we can see. Uh, so this is this is the reason why we're getting these different, uh, uh, you know, different parameter estimates because the individual optimal uh, sets for each orientation are scattered throughout the parameter space. So ideally, what we want to do is choose a set of parameters where the contours all overlap because this will give us a similar root mean squared error across all orientations. Um, and we want to avoid uh, selecting parameters away from the region of overlap because when we do this, we might get large prediction errors. So for example, this purple contour all the way out here, uh, its optimal solution is, is indicated by its uh, marker there, and that's actually uh, what we identified uh, from that vertical uh, cantilever beam, which I showed the prediction er errors earlier for. So what we can do is we can look at um, improving we, we, we had a look at how we can improve parameter precision. So previously used one orientation to identify the parameters and we got prediction errors up to eight millimeters. So what we looked at was uh, thinking what happens when you start combining the information from different orientations. So for example, um, in this case we used two orientations to identify the parameters and this is what our contours look like now. So each of these contours represents a random combination of two, uh, of two orientations. Now we can, so we identified the parameters from those two orientations and then we use the remaining orientations to uh, check the prediction accuracy. And what we find is before we had an eight millimeter uh, prediction error with one orientation, now we've got a 0 0.7 millimeter uh, prediction error. Um, maximum prediction error. So, so we can continue doing this. We can keep on adding more orientations. And we, what we find is that uh, the contours start overlapping as we add more and more orientations. And the parameter variability decreases. Um, they are t all the parameters are tightly packed here while they're scattered out here. And what we also find is that the prediction accuracy increases. So we can use this uh, approach to improve identifiability of model parameters. So that was the first, uh, the first layer arrangement uh, we considered when looking at these uh, validation experiments. So now I also considered uh, the th a thin layer coupled to underlying thicker layer. Um, so in this case, what we did was we created a two layer composite uh, phantom, which, which uh, included a stiff rubber membrane, uh, tightly coupled to a soft silicon gel block. And what we did was we independently identified the stiffness of the rubber membrane by performing biaxial stretch tests, uh, independently identified the stiffness of the gel layer by performing indentation tests. And then what we did was we used the identified stiffnesses for each of those layers uh, and, we put, uh, and we used them to predict the deformation when indenting the composite. Um, so what we can then do is compare our prediction with measurements from an actual indentation test, and this allows us to validate our, our model predictions of this layer arrangement. So the first thing I'll go over is uh, how we did these biaxial tests. So, um, so to do this, I used the, uh, the ABI's uh, biaxial rig, and, and uh, I did this by first laser cutting uh, a sample of rubber dam, and then speckling, uh, applying a speckle pattern to the surface of the membrane. Uh, we then mounted uh, this membrane uh, using Kevlar thread to eight four strands deuces on the biaxial rig. Now, uh, each of these four strands deuces is attached to a linear actuator. And what we can then do is we can apply displacements uh, using these actuators and we can stretch the membrane. So, in to so we applied a total displacement of 4,500 microns uh, on each actuator and tracked the displacement of the speckles on the surface using a phase cross-correlation algorithm. So this plot here uh, indicates the magnitude of the track displacements and we, we can see that we get up to 3,600 micron uh, displacements within the interior of the uh, membrane. Well, we also determined the force at each uh, attachment point, uh, and we found that it was a, a linear force uh, displacement relationship. So we can use this information now to actually create a model to identify the stiffness of the membrane. 
So this is a finite element model created uh, of this membrane. And in, in, this, uh, in this figure here, the green spots indicate uh, the location where we applied force boundary conditions from the measurements. And the red spots indicate where we applied displacement boundary conditions. Now this was to make sure we don't get a statically indeterminate uh, solution. And then we can identify the stiffness uh, of, the, of this uh, membrane by minimizing the difference between the model predicted displacements of the speckles and the measured displacement of the speckles. And these are the results we get. we get. So we found the stiffness to be 135 kilopascals. And this figure here shows uh, the error when we simulated the model using that, uh, that set of parameters. Well, that parameter. Um, yeah. And what we found here was the overall, we found an overall root mean squared error of 154 micron uh, for uh, 3,600 micron displacements, up to 3,600 micron displacements. So uh, now I'll talk about uh, how we perform the indentations test. So to do this, um, we created a composite phantom that allowed us to sandwich a rubber membrane between a plate and a gel mold. So this is what this is what uh, the clamped arrangement looks like. Just ignore those. Um, and what we can then do is uh, we can pour gel into the, uh, the gel mold. And after the gel cures, um, it'll create a tightly coupled interface between the membrane and the gel. So what we can then do is perform indentation on the gel surface uh, of, this, uh, of this phantom. And then we can remove the bottom plate and then apply indentation on the membrane. We can flip it upside down and perform indentation on the membrane surface. Now, the nice thing about this is that it allows us to use the same silicon gel mix for both experiments. So we perform these uh, uh, indentation experiments using the AVI's uh, micro robot and applied a normal indentation of 3,500 uh, microns on, e on each surface and measured the force at the at the tip of the indented during uh, this indentation procedure. At the same time, we also applied a speckle pattern uh, to, the surf to each surface we indented, and we tracked the displacement using a stereoscopic, a three-camera stereoscopic system. So here's a view of the indentation um, um, from the cameras. So the first row shows indentation of the gel surface, and the, uh, the second row shows indentation of the membrane surface. And here's, a, here's a the tracking results. So these are a bird's eye view of the indenta indented surface. And the left plot here shows indentation of the gel surface. And the right one shows the indentation on the membrane surface. And the color here indicates the magnitude of the track displacements. Um, so what we, what we found here was that the stiffer membrane uh, acts to spread the deformation around the tip in when we're indenting this, uh, the membrane surface. While at, on the gel surface, since the gel is more compliant, the deformation is more localized around the tip of the indenter. So and here is the uh, corresponding force uh, versus indentation depth profiles for the gel, um, for the indenting the gel surface and indenting the membrane surface. So now what we did was we can use uh, this information, part of this information, to identify the gel stiffness. Uh, so what I did here was create a, a 3D finite element model um, of the gel layer of this composite and applied the measured indentation force to simulate uh, you know, this in indentation on, the, on, the, on this gel layer. Now this, this is actually a 3D mesh. I'm just showing the top surface here. Um, so what we can do then is identify the stiffness of this, uh, of this gel layer by minimizing the difference between the model predicted displacement of the speckles and the measured displacement of the speckles. Um, and this is what we find uh, that we've got a, we found a gel stiffness of uh, 1.92 kilopascals. And again, here's a bird's eye view of this indented surface. And it, sh it plots the error um, between the model predicted displacement and the measured displacement for that when we simulate the model with 1.92 kilopascals. So we obtained, uh, 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 we obtained a root mean squared error of 227 microns uh, from this procedure. So we now have everything we need to validate the modeling of the composite phantom. So we have the membrane stiffness of 135 kilopascals. We have the gel stiffness, which is 1.92 kilopascals, which is considerably uh, softer. Um, what we did then was create a 3D finite element model of the, of the composite, assign the identified membrane 
uh, membrane stiffness and gel stiffness to each of the layers, and then applied a force, uh, the force uh, boundary condition from the indentation experiments on the composite, and then predict, predicted the resulting surface deformation. Now, we can assess the accuracy of the prediction by comparing the difference between the predicted uh, displacement of the speckles and the measured displacement of the speckles. Uh, and these are the results. So here's a, again a bird's eye view of the indented surface and uh, this shows, this plot shows the error uh, distribution again between the model predicted displacements of the speckles and the measured displacements of the speckles. Why is it so asymmetric? Uh, oh, no, that's because of the screen, I think, the projector. You meaning the aspect ratio? No, the blue yeah. oh, okay, so the reason for that is uh, likely because there's some um, there's a bit of error in uh, identifying where the indenter is. So if the indenter is more further up or down, then we're going to get a different uh, you know a different fit. One side will yeah, that's kind of the one of the reasons why that could be. Um, so yeah, so what we found was that uh, those. The model prediction agreed well with the measurements. So, uh, and that's, we found a root mean square of 138 uh, microns. So, and this was up with up to 2,100 micron surface displacements. And those were around the, uh, you know, those largest displacements around this region as well. So this error is fairly small compared with the, um, with the total, well, the magnitude of the uh, displacement near the tip. So, uh, yeah, so overall, for this part of the study, we validated the modeling of soft layered bodies in two arrangements and also demonstrated the use of multiple gravity loading experiments for improving uh, parameter identifiability. So now I'll talk about, um, so now that we validated the modeling of layered uh, soft bodies, we can apply the, the uh, modeling uh, the same sort of modeling procedure to model breast biomechanics. And the breast itself is composed of these uh, multiple layers. So uh, the first application we're interested in uh, for modeling breast, ca uh, breast biomechanics is to help uh, clinicians plan surgical interventions. Now this is by helping them track, uh, you know, regions of interest from the diagnostic prone MR image to the preoperative supine MR image. Now traditionally, these sorts of, this sort of a problem is dealt with using non-rigid registration algorithms, and this has been successfully applied in a number of different, uh, you know, a number of different other organ systems. However, for the breast, this sort of procedure usually fails uh, because the deformation occurring between these two images, observed between these two images, is too large. So, uh, and this is mainly because these sorts of methods don't take into account the mechanics of the problem. So, what we uh, aimed to do was to use patient-specific biomechanical models to provide an initial estimate um, of the tissue motion uh, to help these registration algorithms. So uh, also, the treatment procedures are not performed under image guidance. So uh, the second uh, application we're interested in is to predict tissue motion without uh, image guidance. Now this requires identifying patient-specific uh, tissue properties. So uh, existing studies have focused mainly on registering uh, MRI images uh, of the breast, specifically uh, prone, diagnostic prone MRI images and uh, preoperative supine MRI images. And that was the first application I mentioned. Now, what we can use the information from the registration to identify parameters from shape changes seen in the MRI images. Uh, and this, uh, this will allow us to identify, yeah, so th this we can then use these parameters to predict the tissue deformation uh, without additional image guidance. And this was the second application I mentioned. Um, so one of the, uh, uh, you know, one of the issues we found was that, we saw that was that the, uh, lots of previous studies um, found that they had large simulation errors. Um, you know, they reported large simu simulation errors with mean modeling errors up to 39 millimeters. And we believe this is, uh, related mainly to the shoulder motion. Uh, not these, these models not accounting for the shoulder motion occurring during repositioning uh, correctly. So, oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, so what we aim to do was improve the accuracy of the predictive simulations uh, and the registration by accounting for shoulder motion. So, um, 
Yeah, so how we did this was we developed a framework to register the prone and supine MRI images, and then we used the registration information to identify stiffness parameters. Now, in my thesis, I did this for, uh, I applied this procedure for two volunteers. Uh, in this talk, I'll, uh, I'll present the results uh, for one of these volunteers. So, so I created this uh, breast model from diagnostic prone MRI images and segmented the skin, muscle, and chest wall boundaries. Uh, and then we can create a, a, a finite element mesh using, uh, well, by fitting uh, to, these, uh, to these boundaries, fitting a mesh to these boundaries. Um, so then this, uh, so here is our final uh, a three layer model. We end up making a three layer model and that includes the pectoral muscle, the breast tissues, and the skin. So now we can look at how we can simulate prone to supine deformation. So, uh, what we observe, uh, first of all, is that the breast is already under the influence of gravity during prone imaging. So what we first need to do is determine the gravity-free unloaded state. Once we do that, we can reorient the model re and reapply gravity in the supine orientation. So now, the, um, now, just in terms of how we apply boundary conditions to this model during this uh, repositioning pr procedure, what we observed uh, is actually that the shoulder and arm positions are different between the prone and supine positions. And this can influence the, def the uh, deformation of the breast. So uh, the breast uh, sits on the pectoral muscle. Now this is connected to the arm and the shoulder. So when the shoulder and arm move, uh, the muscle and the breast tissue slide over the rib cage. So previous studies uh, have used incorrect boundary conditions, so they don't restrict the amount the pectoral muscle can slide. Um, and usually the sliding is, is uh, usually in the prone, your arms are usually in front of you, so you're lying down like this, and then in supine, you're, you're, you're on your back, so your arms are further back. So there's a sliding motion from, from uh, the sternum to the axilla region. Uh, so what we did was we applied a linear, linearly varying boundary condition to slide uh, the, the posterior surface of the muscle uh, based on the amount of shoulder motion we saw between the prone and supine MRI images. So now we can, uh, we can use this model to help with the registration problem. So here's, uh, here's an image of the prone MRI image and the supine image. Now these are just representative axial slices. We do have a full 3D uh, data set. So we want to register these two images. So what we can first do is take our model and use an initial, es you know, initial estimate of the parameters and simulate deformation in the supine position. We, and this, this allows us to define a transformation, TM. And what this does, it allows us to map material points in the prone model to ma corresponding material points in the supine uh, position. We can then take our prone MR image, embed it into, uh, into this model, and warp it to the supine position using TM. And this allows us to generate uh, a mechanic simulated supine MRI. Now the shapes of these two, uh, of this image and the actual real supine MRI are quite similar and this, this sort of uh, provides the initial estimate for registration. So we actually performed this registration using a 3D multi-resolution uh, B-spine based freeform deformation model in the IRTK uh, um, registration software. And during this procedure, we use a neutral, normalized mutual information similarity metric. Um, so once we did this, we obtained a new transformation, uh, TR. And this described additional displacements required on top of the model to match the real supine MRI image. Now we can use uh, this TR, these registered displacements, to provide an estimate of the mechanic simulation accuracy. Uh, in other words, if we, if we obtained a small TR, this implies that our mechanic simulation is, is, uh, is quite accurate. So what we, could, what we could actually do is, we could vary the parameters uh, of the model, the stiffness of each layer of the model, to minimize TR. And this allows the tissue stiffness to be identified. And that's what we, uh, what we did. So, when we did this, we found that the magnitude of the 3D uh, register displacements were on the order of 18 millimeters. So what we can then do is we can take these uh, registered displacements, apply them to the mechanic simulated, uh, the mechanic simulated supine, MRI, uh, supine MRI, so we apply these onto this, and we'll get 
a, registr a registration simulated supine MRI. Now that uh, looks quite uh, similar to the real supine MRI. And that's our total uh, our full registration procedure. So we can assess the uh, registration accuracy by comparing uh, distances uh, between segmented landmarks in these two images. And here are, the, here are the specific landmarks that we considered. And this is a 3D C3 view of these landmarks, which we, uh, which we identified, uh, so, sorry, which were distributed throughout the, the breast. So when we looked at this, we found that the max distance between the landmark, the centroids of these landmarks was 1.7 millimeters, which was um, quite good. So overall in this uh, section, um, uh, we found that the models provided a good initial estimate of tissue motion for registering MR images. Uh, and also we identified breast stiffness uh, parameters. So the last, part, uh, the last part of my talk uh, is on uh, designing experiments for improving identifiability of breast model parameters. So in previous studies, uh, the model parameters have been identified, the stiffnesses have been identified from 3D medical images, for example, MRI imaging, in multiple positions, such as the prone position and the supine position, just like what I just uh, previously showed. However, these 3D medical images are not always available in multiple positions, and it's also uh, expensive to obtain additional scans. So what we aim to do was use only surface measurements to identify the model parameters. And also, uh, what we aim to do is determine the optimal experimental design. So we aim to do this using design of experiment techniques. So uh, we developed a generic design of experiment procedure. And what, this, what we can do is, this is we can start off with the initial estimate of the parameters. And we can simulate an initial experimental design through the computational model. We can then examine the identifiability of the model parameters and then optimize the protocol of the experiments to maximize the identifiability, um, this identifiability of the model parameters. Now this will give us an optimal experimental design and we can apply this experimental design in practice and estimate, uh, you know, real, uh, estimates, um, estimate some real uh, model parameters and this will give us these updated uh, parameters. Now what we might find is that the, the parameters we identified from uh, really, uh, you know, applying the design in real life produce, you know, they're quite different from the initial estimate of the parameters. So if, if, if this occurs, then we need to repeat this procedure until we get a, con, uh, you know, a converged set of parameters. And this allows us to determine which est experiments provide us with the best data to maximize identifiability of the model parameters. So we applied this design of experiment approach to our problem. So what we want to do is identify the model parameters, now these des describing the stiffness of the different layers. We have access to diagnostic MRI images in the prone orientation. We can scan the breast in a different orientation. Uh, so this allows identification of the model parameters from the shape changes between these two orientations. So the question here is what is the best orientation that will maximize identifiability of the model parameters? And we illustrate this uh, design of experiment approach using a two-parameter breast model. So the first thing we can do is simulate a scanning experiment. So what, what we did is here's our prone model. We simulated uh, a, a, a target orientation. And then we can generate uh, synthetic data on the, surface of the, on the surface of the model to simulate uh, a scanning, uh, 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 um, a surface scan. So what we can then do is we can perturb uh, the parameters of the model and this will res and this will change the shape uh, and it'll change the shape relative to that scanned uh, you know the 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 the, gener the data we generated previously now we can quantify the change in shape by using a sum of squares objective function uh, similar in a similar way that we did for that cantilever beam we can then visualize the the sensitivity of this objective function uh, to perturbations in the parameters and what we find is that the greater the sensitivity of, uh, of this objective function, uh, we find that, uh, we find that it, the, if we have a greater sensitivity to the objective function, we find that the, there's greater curvature in this plot. And that means that it is easier to identify the model parameters. So what we aim to do here is quantify the local curvature. Now we can do this by evaluating the determinant of the Hessian matrix at the unperturbed set of parameters. Uh, which is, yeah, which is there. So, 
So then what we can do is we can, um, we can, we can then find the orientation that maximizes the determinant of the Hessian. And this is known as a d-optimal design. So, uh, so to do this, um, I parameterize the target orientation in spherical, spherical coordinates for simplicity. And this, uh, this requires two orientation angles to be identified, an azimuth angle and an elevation angle. So here are some examples of the target orientations. Uh, for example, the supine position, the, sorry, the, the supine position is here and the prone position is here. So, uh, and here, uh, so I'll show the results now. So we evaluated the determinant of the Hessian for different target orientations. And this is the, this is a, these are the results we get. So um, what we can see is that, so, so sorry, the, the color plot here shows, gives you an indication of the degree of identifiability. So let's look at this first point over here. This, this point uh, uh, corresponds to the prone orientation. Now, what this means is that we, we actually constructed our model from the prone orientation. If we then take a laser scan of it in that same orientation, there is no shape change. So there's, there's no information to, for us to identify these model parameters. So that effectively gives us zero identifiability, and that's what this results uh, showed. So further along from that, um, further along from from that prone orientation, we we get we find the supine position, and just a bit uh, further away from that, we get our optimal orientation, which is effect which is close to the supine position, but with the person rotated a bit to their um, to their left side. So overall, in this part. Of, um, of my thesis, I, so I developed a design of experiment framework to maximize the identifiability of breast model parameters, and also identified a single optimal orientation using only surface measurements. So overall, um, in my thesis, I validated the modeling of soft layered bodies in two arrangements, uh, demonstrated the use of multiple gravity loading experiments for improving a parameter identifiability, uh, developed a breast modeling framework that accounts for shoulder motion when simulating prone to supine repositioning and developed and applied a design of experiment framework to maximize identifiability of breast model parameters. So um, I'll, I'd really like to thank my supervisors, uh, Paul and Martin, and for all the help they've uh, given me throughout, um, you know, throughout my thesis. Um, and also I'd like to thank Chris uh, and Andrew for all the support they've given. And also uh, uh, a lot of the, the guys here, uh, Matt Parker, uh, Amir, Al Alex, Habib, Dwayne, and uh, a lot of the guys in the uh, breast modeling group, skin modeling group, the bioinstrumentation group, and the open seams group. So thank you, thank you very much. Questions? Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, um, can you, Chris, can you go back a couple of slides when you were doing this analysis here just for a particular model of the breast? Yes, that's correct, yes. How, how much variation would you expect to see in those sort of optimal angles um, across a whole range of different breast shapes? I mean, is there any way of knowing? Ah, yes. Ooh, and I kind of... So one way we can do this, so... At the moment, what we're what we've been what we've been doing is we've been collecting a lot of uh, you know MRI scans from volunteers. So this allows us to create population models. So once we have these population models, we can do PC analysis type things, and we can get a mean shape. We can do the analysis, this analysis on the mean shape, and then we can also look at uh, you know the different modes. So uh, so we can look at different extremes of the population, and then redo this sort of analysis. And then you'll get an idea of how much the optimal design may change uh, throughout the population. Yeah. So that's one of the things I was keen to actually uh, try out. Well, first of all, it was a lot of work. And mm. I just lost my comfort on myself. But apart from that, I, I just want to know that if we present this sort of modeling to medical doctors, um, when, when they are in operating room, um, what what is the ideal accuracy ah. that they need when they are, you know, 
just taking the tumor out. Yeah, so this, this is actually, um, ideally they'll have, you know, very high accuracy. Wh what they normally do when they take out these tumors is, uh, there's, they don't just take out the tumor itself, they need to take a margin out. And that's how they test whether they have actually taken out the tumor. They check the margin. And there has to be a clearance around the tumor. And uh, so that's actually the sort of, that's what their target is. So there's, there's different margins which range from, you know, one millimeter all the way up to 10 millimeters. Um, so, yeah, so they need to be able to find that entire region. Now exactly, uh, you know, you are asking basically how, how would we present the results from these models? Um, yeah, so one way of doing that is, uh, so we haven't actually done this, but one way is, uh, you know, augmented reality sort of uh, setups. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of steps before that because when surgeons are, you know, cutting things out, they're, you know, they're moving around like crazy. So uh, we actually kind of need to be able to model, you know, predict that deformation at the same kind of speed, otherwise we're really going to miss. These tumors are qu can be quite small, so they range, you know, you know, five millimeters to, you know, 20 millimeters, I think, for early stage breast cancers. I, I, I think that's right, yeah. 20 millimeters, yeah, up to two centimeters. So, um, yeah, so that's, yeah, I mean, the real benefit of these models is when, uh, is, is about this, you know, so normally surgeons feel the tumor they do palpation to find where the tumor is. So this is okay if it's a stiff tumor, but uh, what happens when the stiffness of the tumor is similar to the surrounding tissues? And that's where the big problem is because uh, 20 to 40 percent of the, you know, uh, these sorts of operations to remove tumors have to be redone because they haven't taken the tumor out, uh, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. And, and how, how far they normally go to breathing? Ah, yes, yes. The normal breathing can affect, uh, yeah, so that is, uh, ooh, I can't remember the numbers, but I looked at the, this, so there's some studies where they put surgical clips inside and they looked at the motion of those surgical clips during, um, um, you know, breathing. And I think they were on the order of four or five millimeters. They were quite, uh, fairly large. So that is something also we need to take into account, any breathing motion. So yeah, so these are kind of quasi-static models, uh, but we can we can start looking at uh, you know some sort of boundary conditions on the model to simulate sort of uh, it's kind of like a rigid motion because the breast sits on top of the sternum um, and the lungs are within that. So we might be able to uh, model that, but we have to you know we have to detect that, and that could be done possibly using you know stereo system uh, stereo cameras. The surface and track the surface displacement and pull out a rigid body motion from that and uh, move the model with that. Mm -hmm. oh. Hey, Bert. Um, Prasad, you mentioned that if there's a tumor in the breast, then that locally can, can stiffen the tissue locally. Um, if it's, it may not, but it could. Yeah. It could, yes. Um, if it was, and, and perhaps up to 20 millimeters. Have you looked at how that might affect the mechanics of ah. the motion? No, no. In all, in all these uh, models, we're s still trying to get the, you know, the mechanics of the healthy one working first. So yeah. <laughs> so then, then we can start looking at the uh, locally stiffening up the, uh, yeah, um, yeah. The t and and I guess so. At this, uh, this is something I need to double check. But I mean, our our volunteer data doesn't have tumors. Our clinical data may have tumors, and that'll give us an idea of the distribution of those tumors, and we can start targeting, uh, you know, start looking at accuracy speci specific to certain regions, and look at those tumors in those regions. Yeah. Did you uh, explicitly decide not to include a model of the platysma muscle, or is it, does it not make much of no. contribution? No, so so the muscles that contribute, which the the main muscle that's uh, you know deforms a lot is the pectoral muscle. It has a huge, quite a large effect. Um, the other one is the pectoral minor, but that doesn't really play a role. But it will, you know, it does affect the mechanics in s to some degree because the pectoral muscle will slide over that. Yeah. But the platysma muscle inserts not. It not under the chest wall, but into the skin. Yeah. Can, uh, Corey, want to help me out? 
Are you going to show me? Do I show? Yeah. So this is, yeah, I mean, this is... Yeah. So, I mean, this is something we can look at. The one issue we have with these sorts of, uh, you know, the data sets is this, the data set I uh, looked at, it cuts off around here. So we don't get any information around that. Now, with our new volunteer studies, we get all the way up to here and all the way down, you know, up to here. So we've got information now to look outside, you know, the normal clinical imaging region. Now, the problem with this is, like, ideally, we can see how much of these muscles, uh, you know, how much influence they have by, look, by doing a registration. We can register the movement of those muscles between the prone and supine image, for instance. That'll tell us how much, how much deformation there is. That, is. that will be ideal. The problem with that is we actually need to segment out the different, uh, you know, boundaries uh, of those tissues and then apply the registration because the registration I'm applying assumes it's a continuous motion and that's not true because uh, in, in you know in certain parts because they're sl relative sliding so we either need to change our registration to account for discontinuities uh, or individually track certain regions now all of that depends on the accuracy of the registration sorry the, the image quality image quality so that's the other thing we need to look at so that is something I, I can consider um, um, looking at the influence of that muscle those fascias I'm not sure that that is correct, but it's struck that you are modifying or, or, or optimizing your material parameters locally mm -hmm. to give you the best fit uh, for the observed deformations. For the which experiment? Which uh, uh, for for uh, so when you were doing the when you were doing the the fits the deformation experiments. Uh, so the indentation ones or no, no, the, the on the breast on the breast on the breast. So the, the question was, do you think? I mean, that, you're using that to give you a, uh, a framework for uh, interpreting uh, loading, I guess. But do you think, does that give you any, any further information about, uh, about the mechanics of the breast? I mean, you're, you're actually, do you gain anything useful from those local estimates or local alterations of material properties there? Uh, so, so for the breast studies we did, we looked at the tracking results throughout the entire breast. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, so now so you're asking if that's going to give us some information. Can you, can you gain information? So, yeah, the main information we can get is what's actually involved uh, during the breast deformation, which is still unclear. Uh, there are certain aspects, like the sliding, the muscle sliding business. A lot of people have kind of ignored this completely. Sure, it's very nice. Yeah, so, so, there's, so there's, now in terms of how, how much it can help us, it, it, it really, so the whole idea of this is to help track tumors and yeah, things like yeah, that. Sure. So um, in that sense, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it, other than kind of providing, um, uh, I guess, allowing us to figure out what's actually happening in the breast, that's kind of, for this specific application, that might be all we can gain so from that. But there's tools, as far as you're concerned, to give you the uh, transformation yeah. or the registration. Yes, uh, so, yeah. yes, and also to predict uh, the deformation yes. when we don't have the images. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, there, will, there may be other applications where uh, this sort of... Um, but you would argue, wouldn't you, that if there were... Uh, a tumor that might alter the oh uh, yeah oh absolutely and I think they, they could be because there's you know the tumor is two centimeters large uh, mm. uh, uh, you know they most likely will affect the mechanics mm. uh, other other so there have been other studies in different parts of the body for example the brain mm. where they've shown that if, even though there's stiff uh, tumors they're carried uh, you know they're carried by the displacement field of the of the surrounding tissues so that's something we have to find the structure is different here because there are things like Cooper's ligaments going through from the skin to the, uh, to the um, muscle fascia. So that may actually, if you have a tumor stuck there, yeah, it might actually start affecting the, uh, the mechanics. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Prasad. Thank you for. And a uh, very interesting talk, and uh, you finished every sentence. <laughs> oh, yes. I was concentrating on this. I was concentrating on this. Oh, really? So there are